Welcome back uh, to another Lord's Day as we look at another sermon and preaching through history. Uh, we're going to go and look at Charles Spurgeon again, someone who we featured here, and his sermon, uh, Compel Them to Come In. Uh, but let's begin in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, uh, you have called us, you have given us new hearts and called us to your Son, uh, not by any type of violence, but by a sweet compelling where we were persuaded by your Spirit to come to the throne of Christ, Lord. Encourage us uh, through the evangelism of Charles Spurgeon uh, that we may be reminded of the sweet calling that is to our King and be encouraged to call others to the goodness of Christ. We ask this all in his name. Amen. So this particular message from Charles Spurgeon is entirely evangelistic. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, like I said, who we featured here before, was the head preacher of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. Uh, born 1834, died 1892. Uh, prince of preachers, the style and method of his preaching uh, attracted large crowds. In fact, his largest crowd was 23,000 people. Uh, he was a prodigy, a natural, preaching in his teenage years all the way up until his death. Uh, he was always thinking of preaching, always preaching when he had opportunity. Uh, he, he spoke very fast, and he spoke in preacher language. Uh, when he would go and prepare or walk up to the pulpit, he would take one page of notes. And these were more like bullet points than they were a full page of notes. He didn't use a full manuscript. And with one page of notes, he would talk for more than 40 minutes at a speed of 140 words per minute. So he was a very fast talker. He was able to uh, bring up scripture and points on the fly, uh, very skilled. And the messages that he preached were very compelling. Uh, there's several instances of an evangelistic change in people's hearts when they heard him preach. There was one man who was uh, in the tabernacle fixing or preparing uh, the lights and the sound and they heard Spurgeon practicing and he said that's when he came to faith. Uh, in those days people would print out the sermons of Charles Spurgeon and they'd be distributed. Uh, there is this wonderful instance of a lady who went to go and buy butter. And in those days, uh, we, they didn't have butter in a refrigerator. They salted it and wrapped it in paper. And so she went to go buy butter, and it was wrapped in one of Charles Spurgeon's sermons. And when she read it, she said that she had come to faith and started attending his church through butter. <laughs> As an evangelist, Spurgeon would always include evangelistic messages in his messages, and he would always carry up a, a bunch of tracts in his pocket, handing them out when he was out and about, and he would always write to friends who he would believe would be on the cusp of the kingdom, uh, always thinking about reaching out. Now, this sermon which I'm going to begin, is fairly long, but like I said, it's, it's uniquely evangelistic. Now, not in this sermon, but there are times where Spurgeon is thinking entirely about the lost, that he does something that you wouldn't think pastors, Orthodox pastors would do. He tells his primary congregation to not come to church. He says, don't come leave your seat open for the lost. 
and he ends up filling the church with people who are wanting to come and hear Charles Spurgeon speak. Uh, it worked out. It was phenomenal. Uh, again, I don't know if I, we would do that here at the well. Hey, guys, don't come to church. Hopefully somebody will come in. He was very good at advertising, and there was a lot of people that uh, would come to hear him speak. This particular sermon compelled him to come in. was preached December 5th. 1858, uh, in his early 20s. Uh, like I said, very unique in the sense that it is evangelistic to the core. And what you're going to hear is Spurgeon pleading with the lost at every different avenue. If one attempt doesn't work out, he says, well, if, if you didn't like that, perhaps you'll listen to this. Or perhaps you'll listen to this. And he goes on and on and on. <clears throat> and with that, I'm going to jump right in to compel them to come in. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Compel them to come in. I feel in such a haste to go out and obey this commandment this morning by compelling those to come in who are now tarrying in the highways and hedges, that I cannot wait for an introduction, but must at once set about my business. Hear then, O ye, that are strangers to the truth as it is in Jesus. Hear then the message that I have to bring you. Ye have fallen, fallen in your father Adam. Ye have fallen also in yourselves by your daily sin and your constant iniquity. You have provoked the anger of the Most High, and as assuredly as you have sinned, so certainly must God punish you if you persevere in your iniquity. For the Lord is a God of justice, and will by no means spare the guilty. But have you not heard? Hath it not long been spoken in your ears that God, in his infinite mercy, has devised a way whereby, without any infringement upon his honor, he can have mercy upon you? the guilty and the undeserving. To you I speak, and my voice is unto you, O sons of men. Jesus Christ, very God of very God, hath descended from heaven and was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Begotten of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived in this world a life of exemplary holiness and of the deepest suffering, till at last he gave himself up to die for our sins, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. And now the plan of salvation is simply declared unto you. Whosoever believeth in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. For you who have violated all the precepts of God and have disdained his mercy and dared his vengeance, there is yet mercy proclaimed. For whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Whosoever cometh unto him, he will in no wise cast out for he is able to save unto the uttermost them that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Now, all that God asks of you, and this he gives you, is that you will simply look at his bleeding, dying son and trust your souls in the hands of him whose name alone can save from death and hell. Is it not a marvelous thing that the proclamation of this gospel does not receive the unanimous consent of men? One would think that as soon as ever this was preached, that whosoever believeth shall, come, uh, shall have eternal life, every one of you, casting away every man his sins and his iniquities, would lay hold on Jesus Christ and look alone to his cross. But alas, such is the desperate evil of our nature, such the pernicious depravity of our character, that this message is despised. The invitation to the gospel feast is rejected, and there are many of you who are this day enemies of God by wicked works, enemies to the God who preaches Christ to you today, enemies to him who sent his son to give his life a ransom for many. 
Strange, I say it is, that it should be so. Yet nevertheless, it is the fact, and hence the necessity for the command of the text, compel them to come in. Children of God, ye who have believed, I shall have little or nothing to say to you this morning. I am going straight to my business. I am going after those who will not come, those that are in the byways and hedges, and God going with me. It is my duty now to fulfill this command, compel them to come in. First, I must find you out. Secondly, I will go to work to compel you to come in. First, I must find you out. If you read the verses that precede the text, you will find an amplification of this command. Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And then afterwards, go out into the highways. Bring in the vagrants, the highwaymen, and into the hedges, bring in those that have no resting place for their heads and are lying under the hedges for rest. Bring them in also and compel them to come in. Yes, I see you this morning, you that are poor. I am to compel you to come in. You are poor in circumstances, but this is no barrier to the kingdom of heaven. For God hath, no, hath not exempted from his grace the man that shivers in rags and who is destitute of bread. In fact, if there be any distinction made, the distinction is made on your side and for your benefit. Unto you is the word of salvation sent, for the poor have the gospel preached unto them. But especially I must speak to you who are poor spiritually. You have no faith, you have no virtue, you have no good work, you have no grace, and what is poverty worse still, you have no hope. Ah, my master has sent you a gracious invitation. Come and welcome to the marriage feast of his love. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. Come, I must lay hold upon you. Though you be defiled with foulest filth, and though you have not but rags upon your back, though your own righteousness has become a filth as filthy clouts, Yet must I lay hold upon you and invite you first and even compel you to come in. And now I see you again. You are not only poor, but you are maimed. There was a time when you thought you could work out your own salvation without God's help, when you could perform good works, attend to ceremonies, and get to heaven by yourselves. But now you are maimed. The sword of the law has cut off your hands, and now you can work no longer. You say, with bitter sorrow, the best performances of my hands dares not appear before thy throne. You have lost all power now to obey the law. You feel that when you would do good, evil is present with you. You are maimed. You have given up as a forlorn hope all attempt to save yourself because you are maimed and your arms are gone. But you are worse off than that. For if you could not work your way to heaven, yet you could walk your way there along the road by faith. But you are maimed in the feet as well as in the hands. You feel that you cannot believe, that you cannot repent, that you cannot obey the stipulations of the gospel. You feel that you are utterly undone, powerless in every respect to do anything that can be pleasing to God. In fact, you are crying out, Oh, that I could but believe, then all would be easy. I would, but I cannot. Lord, relieve, my help must come from thee. To you am I sent also, but you am I to lift up to the blood-stained banner of the cross. To you am I to preach this gospel. Whoso calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And unto you am I to cry, Whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. 
There is yet another class. You are halt. You are halting between two opinions. You are sometimes seriously inclined, and at another time, worldly gaiety calls you away. What little progress you do make in religion is but a limp. You have a little strength, but that is so little that you make it painful progress. Ah, limping brother, to you also is the word of this salvation sent. Though you halt between two opinions, the master sends me to you with this message. How long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve him. Consider thy ways, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Because I will do this, prepare to meet thy God. O Israel, halt no longer, but decide for God and his truth. And yet I see another class, the blind. Yes, you that cannot see yourselves, that think yourselves good when you are full of evil, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, darkness for light and light for darkness, to you I am sent. You blind souls that cannot see your lost estate, that do not believe that sin is so exceedingly sinful as it is, and who will not be persuaded to think that God is a just and righteous God, to you am I sent. To you that cannot see the Savior, that see no beauty in him, that you should desire him, who see no excellence in virtue, no glories in religion, no happiness in serving God, no delight in being his children, to you also am I sent. I, to whom am I not sent, if I take my text? For it goes further than this. It not only gives a particular description so that each individual case may be met, but afterwards it makes a general sweep and says, Go into the highways and hedges. Here we bring in all ranks and conditions of men. My Lord upon his horse in the highway and the women trudging about her business. The thief waylaying the traveler. All these are in the highway and they are all to be compelled to come in. And there away in the hedges, there lie some poor souls who refuges of lies whose refuge of lies sweeps away, and who are seeking not to find some little shelter for their weary heads, to you also are we sent this morning. This is the universal command, compel them to come in. Now, I pause after having described the character. I pause to look at the Herculean labor that lies before me. Well, did Melanchthon say, old Adam was too strong for young Melanchthon. As well might a little child seek to compel a Samson, as I seek to lead a sinner to the cross of Christ. And yet my master sends me about the errand. Lo, I see the great mountain before me of human depravity and stolid indifference. But by faith I cry, where art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. Does my master say, compel them to come in? Then though the sinner be like Samson and I a child, I shall lead him with a thread. If God saith, do it, if I attempt it in faith, it shall be done. And if with a groaning, struggling and weeping heart, I seek, oh, I so seek this day to compel sinners to come to Christ, the sweet compulsions of the Holy Spirit shall go with every word, and some indeed shall be compelled to come in. And now to the work, directly to the work. Unconverted, unreconciled, unregenerate, unregenerate men and women, I am to compel you to come in. Permit me first of all to accost you in the highways of sin and tell you over again my errand. The king of heaven this morning sends a gracious invitation to you. He says, as I live, saith the Lord, 
I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, but had rather that he should turn unto me and live. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be whiter than snow. Dear brother, it makes my heart rejoice to think that I should have such good news to tell you, and yet I confess my soul is heavy because I see you do not think it good news, but turn away from it, and do not give it due regard. Permit me to tell you what the king has done for you. He knew your guilt. He foresaw that you would ruin yourself. He knew that his justice would demand your blood, and in order that his, this difficulty might be escaped, that his justice might be, have its full due, and that you might yet be saved, Jesus Christ hath died. Will you just for a moment glance at this picture? You see that man there on his knees in the garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood. You see this next. You see that miserable sufferer tied to a pillar and lashed with terrible scourges till the shoulder bones are seen like white islands in the midst of a sea of blood. Again, you see this third picture. It is the same man hanging on the cross with hands extended, with feet nailed fast, dying, groaning, bleeding. Methought the picture spoke and said, it is finished. And now all this hath Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth done in order that God might consistently with his justice pardon sin. And the message to you this morning is this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That is, trust him, renounce thy works and thy ways and set thine heart alone on this man who gave himself for sinners. Well, brother, I have told you the message. What sayest thou unto it? Do they turn away? You tell me it is nothing to you. You cannot listen to it, that you will hear me by and by, but you will go your way this day and attend to your farm and merchandise. Stop, brother. I was not told merely to tell you and then go about my business. No, I am told to compel you to come in and permit me to observe to you before I go further that there is one thing I can say and to which God is my witness this morning that I am in earnest with you in my desire that you should comply with this command of God. You may despise your own salvation, but I do not despise it. You may go away and forget what you shall hear, but you will, ple you will be pleased to remember that the things I now say cost me many a groan ere I come here to utter them. My inmost soul is speaking out to you, my poor brother. When I beseech you by him that liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore, consider my master's message, which he bids me now to address you. But do you spurn it? Do you still refuse it? Then I must change my tone a minute. I will not merely tell you the message and invite you as I do with all earnestness and sincere affection. I will go further. Sinner, in God's name, I command you to repent and believe. Do you ask me whence my authority? I am an ambassador of heaven. My credentials, some of them secret, and in my own heart, and others of them open before you this day in the seals of my ministry, sitting and standing in this hall where God has given me many souls for my hire. As God, the everlasting one, hath given me a commission to preach this gospel, I command you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, not on my own authority, but on the authority of him who said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then annexed this solemn sanction, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Reject my message and remember, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. 
of how much sore punishment suppose ye that he shall be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God. An ambassador is not to stand below the man with whom he deals, for we stand higher. And the minister, if the minister chooses to take his proper rank, girded with the omnipotence of God and anointed with his holy unction, he is to command men and speak with all authority, compelling them to come in, command, exhort, rebuke with all long suffering. But do you turn away and say you will not be commanded? Then again, I will change my note. If that avails not, all other means shall be tried. My brother, I come to you simple of speech, and I exhort you to flee to Christ. O oh, my brother, dost thou know what a loving Christ he is? Let me tell thee from my own soul what I know of him. I too once despised him. He knocked at the door of my heart, and I refused to open it. He came to me, times without number, morning by morning and night by night. He checked me in my conscience and spoke to me by his spirit. And when at last the thunders of the law prevailed in my conscience, I thought that Christ was cruel and unkind. Oh, I can never forgive myself that I should have thought so ill of him. But what a loving reception did I have when I went to him. I thought he would smite me, but his hand was not clenched in anger, but open wide in mercy. I thought full sure that his eyes would dart lightning flashes of wrath upon me, but instead thereof they were full of tears. He fell upon my neck and kissed me. He took off my rags and did clothe me with his righteousness and caused my soul to sing aloud for joy. While in the house of my heart and in the house of his church there was music and dancing because his son that he had lost was found. And he that was dead was al made alive. I exhort you then to look to Jesus Christ and to be lightened. Sinner, you will never regret. I will be bondsman for my master that you will never regret it. You will have no sigh to go back to your state of condemnation. You shall go out of Egypt and shall go into the promised land and shall find it flowing with milk and honey. The trials of Christian life you shall find heavy, but you will find peace. You will find grace will make them light. And as far and as for the joys and delights of being a child of God, if I lie this day, you shall charge me with it in days to come. If you will taste and see that the Lord is good, I am not afraid, but that you shall find that he is not only good, but better than human lips ever can describe. I know not what arguments to use with you. I appeal to your own self-interests. Oh, my poor friend, would it not be better for you to be reconciled to the God of heaven than to be his enemy? What are you getting by opposing God? Are you the happier for being his enemy? Answer, pleasure seeker. Hast thou found delights in that cup? Answer me, self-righteous man. Hast thou found rest for the sole of thy foot in all thy works? O oh, thou that goest about to establish thine own righteousness, I charge thee, let conscience speak. Hast thou found it to be a happy path? O oh, my friend, wherefore dost thou spend thy money for that which is not bread, and thy labor for which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. I exhort you by everything that is sacred and solemn, everything that is important and eternal. Flee for your lives. Look not behind you. Stay not uh, in all the plain. Stay not until you have proved and found an interest in the blood of Jesus Christ, that blood which cleanses us from all sin. Are you still cold and indifferent? Will not the blind man permit me to lead him to the feast? 
Will not my maimed brother put his hand upon my shoulder and permit me to assist him to the banquet? Will not the poor man allow me to walk side by side with him? Must I use some stronger words? Must I use some other compulsion to compel you to come in? Sinner, this one thing I am resolved upon this morning. If you be not saved, ye shall be without excuse. Yea, from the gray-headed down to the tender age of childhood. If ye this day lay not hold on Christ, your blood shall be on your own head. If there be power in man to bring his fellow, as there is when man is helped by the Holy Spirit, that power shall be exercised this morning. God helping me. Come, I am not to be put off by your rebuffs. If my exhortation fails, I must come to see, I must come to something else. My brother, I entreat you, I entreat you, stop and consider. Do you know what it is you are rejecting this morning? You are rejecting Christ, your only Savior. Other foundation can no man lay. There is none other given, no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. My brother, I cannot bear that you should do this, for I remember what you are forgetting. The day is coming when you will want a savior. It is not long ere weary months shall have ended and your strength begin to decline. Your pulse shall fail you. Your strength shall depart. And you and the grim monster, death, must face each other. What will you do in the swellings of Jordan without a savior? Deathbeds are stony things without the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an awful thing to die anyhow. He that hath the best hope and the most triumphant faith finds that death is not a thing to laugh at. It is a terrible thing to pass from the, un from the seen to the unseen, from the mortal to the immortal, from time to eternity. And you will find it hard to go through the iron gates of death without the sweet wings of angels to conduct you to the portals of the sky. It will be a hard thing to die without Christ. I cannot help thinking of you. I see you acting the suicide this morning, and I picture myself standing at your bedside and hearing your cries and knowing that you are dying without hope. I cannot bear that. I, am think, I think I am standing by your coffin now and looking into your cold, clay cold face and saying, this man despised Christ and neglected the great salvation. I think what bitter tears I shall weep then if I think that I have been unfaithful to you and how those eyes fast closed in death shall seem to chide me and say, Minister, I attended the music hall, but you were not in earnest with me. You amused me, you preached to me, but you did not plead with me. You did not know what Paul meant when he said, as thou, God, did beseech you by us, we prayed you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. I entreat you, let this message enter your heart for another reason. I picture myself standing at the bar of God. As the Lord liveth, the day of judgment is coming. You believe that. You are not an infidel. Your conscience would not permit you to doubt the scripture. Perhaps you may have pretended to do so, but you cannot. You feel there must be a day when God shall judge the world in righteousness. I see you standing in the midst of that throng, and the eye of God is fixed on you. It seems to you that he is not looking anywhere else, but only upon you. And he summons you before him, and he reads your sins, and he cries, Depart, ye cursed, into everlasting fire and hell. My hearer, I cannot bear to think of you in that position. It seems as if every hair in my head must stand on end to think of any hearer of mine being damned. Will you picture yourselves in that position? The word has gone forth, depart, ye cursed. Do you see the pit as it opens to swallow you up? Do you listen to the shrieks and yells of those who have preceded you to that eternal lake of torment? 
Instead of picturing the scene, I turn to you with the words of the inspired prophet, and I say, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Oh, my brother, I cannot let you put away religion thus. No, I think of what is to come after death. I should be destitute of all humanity if I should see a person about to poison himself and did not dash away the cup. Or if I saw another about to plunge himself from London Bridge, if I did not assist in preventing him from doing so, and I should be worse than a fiend if I did not now, with all love and kindness and earnestness, beseech you to lay hold on eternal life, to labor not for the meat that perisheth, but for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life. Some hyper-Calvinist would tell me I am wrong in doing. I cannot help it. I must do it. As I must stand before my judge at last, I feel that I should not make full proof of my ministry unless I entreat with many tears that ye would be saved, that ye would look into Jesus Christ and receive his glorious salvation. But does not this avail? Are all our entreaties lost upon you? Do you turn a deaf ear? Then again, I change my note. Sinner, I have pleaded with you as a man pleadeth with his friend. And were it for my own life, I could not speak more earnestly than this morning than I do speak concerning yours. I do feel earnest about my own soul, but not a whit more than I do about the souls of my congregation this morning. And therefore, if ye put away these entreaties, I have something else. I must threaten you. You shall not always have such warnings as these. A day is coming when hushed shall be the voice of every gospel minister, at least for you. For your ear shall be cold and death. It shall not be any more threatening. It shall be the fulfillment of the threatening. There shall be no promise, no proclamations of pardon and of mercy, no peace speaking blood, but you shall be in the land where the Sabbath is swallowed up in everlasting nights of misery, and where the preachings of the gospel are forbidden because they would be unavailing. I charge you then, listen to this voice that now addresses your conscience. For if not, God shall speak to you in his wrath, and say unto you in his hot displeasure, I called and ye refused. I stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Therefore I will mock at your calamity. I will laugh when your fear cometh. Sinner, I threaten you again. Remember, it is but a short time you may have to hear these warnings. You imagine that your life will be long, but do you not know how short it is? Have you ever tried to think of how frail you are? Did you ever see a body when it has been cut in pieces by the antinomist? Did you ever see such a marvelous thing as the human frame? Strange, a harp of a thousand strings should keep in tune so long. But let but one of those cords be twisted. Let but a mouthful of food go in the wrong direction, and you may die. The slightest chance, as we have it, may send you swift to death when God wills it. Strong men have been killed by the smallest and slightest accident, and so may you. In the chapel, in the house of God, men have dropped down dead. How often do we hear of men falling in our streets? rolling out of time into eternity by some sudden stroke. And are you sure that heart of yours is quite sound? Is the blood circulating with all accuracy? Are you quite sure of that? And if it be so, how long shall it be? Oh, perhaps there are some of you here that shall never see Christmas Day. It may be the mandate has gone forth already. Seeing thy house is in order, for thou shalt die and not live. 
Out of this vast congregation, I might with accuracy tell you many will be dead in a year. But certain is it that the whole of us shall never meet together again in any one assembly. Some out of this vast crowd, perhaps some two or three, shall depart ere the new year and shall be ushered in. I remind you then, my brother, that either the gate of salvation may be shut or else you may be out of the place where the gate of mercy stands. Come then, let the threatening have power with you. I do not threaten because I would alarm without cause, but in hopes that a brother's threatening may drive you to the place where God hath prepared the feast of the gospel. And now, must I turn hopelessly away? Have I exhausted all that I can say? No, I will come to you again. Tell me what it is, my brother, that keeps you from Christ. I hear one say, Oh, sir, it is because I feel myself too guilty. That cannot be, my friend, that cannot be. But, sir, I am the chief of sinners. Friend, you are not. The chief of sinners died and went to heaven many years ago. His name was Saul of Tarsus, afterwards called Paul the Apostle. He was the chief of sinners. I know he spoke the truth. No, but you still say, I am too vile. You cannot be viler than the chief of sinners. You must, at least, be second worst. Even supposing you are the worst now alive, you are second worst, for he was chief. But suppose you are the worst. Is not that the very reason why you, have, you should come to Christ? Worse a man is, the more reason he should go to the hospital or physician. The more poor you are, the more reason you should accept the charity of another. Now Christ does not want any merits of yours. He gives freely. The worse you are, the more welcome you are. But let me ask you a question. Do you think you will ever get better by stopping away from Christ? If so, you know very little as yet of the way of salvation at all. No, sir. The longer you stay, the worse you will grow. Your hope shall grow weaker. Your despair will become stronger. The nail with which Satan has fastened you down will become more firmly clenched, and you will be less hopeful than ever. Come, I beseech you, rec recollect there is nothing to be gained by delay, but by delay everything may be lost. But, cries another, I feel I cannot believe. No, my friend, and you never will believe if you look first at your own believing. Remember, I am not come to invite you to faith, but I'm come to invite you to Christ. But you say, what is the difference? Why, just this. If you first of all say, I want to believe a thing, you never do it. But your first inquiry must be, what is this thing that I am to believe? Then will faith come as the consequence of that search. Our first business has not to do with faith, but with Christ. Come, I beseech you on Calvary's mount and see the cross. Behold, the Son of God, he who made the heavens and the earth, dying for your sins, look to him. Is there not power in him to save? Look at his face so full of pity. Is there not love in his heart to prove him willing to save? Sure, sinner, the sight of Christ will help thee to believe. Do not believe first and then go to Christ, or else thy faith will be a worthless thing. Go to Christ without any faith and cast thyself upon him, sink or swim. But I hear another cry. Oh, sir, you do not know how often I have been invited, how long I have rejected the Lord. I do not know, and I do, and I do not want to know. All I know is that my master has sent me to compel you to come in. So come along with you now. You may have rejected a thousand invitations. Don't make this the thousands and one. You have been up to the house of God and have only been gospel hardened. 
But do I not see a tear in your eye? Come, my brother, do not be hardened by this morning's sermon. O oh, Spirit of the living God, come and melt this heart, for it has never been melted, and compel him to come in. I cannot let you go on such idle excuses as that. If you have lived so many years slighting Christ, there are, no, there are so many reasons why now you should not slight him. But did I hear you whisper that this was not a convenient time? Then what must I say to you? When will that convenient time come? Shall it come when you are in hell? Will that time be convenient? Shall it come when you are on your dying bed and the death throttle is in your throat? Shall it come then? Or when the burning sweat is scowling on your brow? And then again, or when the cold, clammy sweat is there, shall those be convenient times? When pains are racking you and you are on the borders of the bomb or tomb. <laughs> no, sir, this morning is the convenient time. May God make it so. Remember, I have no authority to ask you to come to Christ tomorrow. The master has given you no invitation to come to him next Tuesday. The invitation is today, if ye shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For the Spirit saith, today, come now and let us reason together. Why should you put it off? It may be the last warning you shall ever have. Put it off, and you may never weep again in chapel. You may never have so earnest a discourse addressed to you. You may not be pleaded with as I would plead with you now. You may go away as God may say, he is given unto idols, let him alone. He shall throw the reins upon your neck and then mark, your course is sure, but it is sure damnation and swift destruction. And now again, is it all in vain? Will you not come to Christ? Then what more can I do? I have but one more resort, and that shall be tried. I can be permitted to weep for you. I can be allowed to pray for you. You shall scorn the address if you like. You shall laugh at the preacher. You shall call him fanatic, if you will. He will not chide you. He will bring no accusation against you to the great judge. Your offense so far as he is concerned is forgiven before it is committed. But you will be remembered that the message that you are rejecting is, this morning is a message from one who loves you and is given to you also by the lips of one who loves you. You will recollect that you may play your soul away with the devil, that you may listlessly think it a matter of no importance, but there, li but there lives at least one who is earnest about your soul, and one who before he came here wrestled with his God for strength to preach to you, and who when he has gone from this place will not forget his hearers of this morning. I say again, when words fail us, we can give tears, for words and tears are the arms with which the gospel ministers compel men to come in. You do not know, and I suppose could not believe, how anxious a man whom God has called to the ministry feels about his congregation, and especially about some of them. I heard but the other day of a young man who attended here a long time, and his father's hope was that he would be brought to Christ. He became acquainted however, with an infidel. And now he neglects his business and lives in a daily course of sin. I saw his father's poor, wan face. I did not ask him to tell me the story himself, for I felt it was raking up a trouble and opening a sore. I fear sometimes that good man's gray hairs may be brought with sorrow to the grave. Young men, you do not pray for yourselves, but your mothers wrestle for you. You will not think of your own souls, but your father's anxiety is exercised for you. I have been at prayer meetings 
when I have heard children of God pray there, and they could not have prayed with more earnestness and more intensity of anguish if they had been each of them seeking their own soul salvation. And it is not strange that we should be ready to move heave heaven and earth for your salvation. And that is still, you should have no thought for yourselves, no regard to eternal things. Now I turn for one moment to some here. There are some of you here, members of Christian churches, who make a profession of religion. But unless I be mistaken in you, and I shall be happy if I am, your profession is a lie. You do not live up to it. You dishonor it. You can live in the perpetual practice of absenting yourself from God's house, if not in sins worse than that. Now I ask such of you who do not adorn the doctrine of God your Savior, do you imagine that you can call me your pastor and yet that my soul cannot tremble over you in sec and in secret weep for you? And I say it may be but little concern to you how you defile the garments of your Christianity, but it is of great concern to God's hidden ones who sigh and cry and groan for the iniquities of the professors of Zion. Now, does anything else remain to the minister besides weeping and prayer? Yes, there is one thing else. God has given to his servants not the power of regeneration, but he has given them something akin to it. It is impossible for any man to regenerate his neighbor. And yet, how are men born to God? Does not the apostle say of such and one that he, he was begotten by him in his bonds? Now the minister has a power given him of God to be considered both the father and the mother of those born to God. For the apostle said he travailed for the birth of souls till Christ was formed in them. What can we do then? We can now appeal to the Spirit. I know I have preached the gospel, that I have preached it earnestly. I challenge my master to honor his own promise. He has said it shall not return unto me void, and it shall not. It is in his hands, not mine. I cannot compel you, but thou, O Spirit of God, who has the key of the heart, thou canst compel. Did you ever notice in the chapter of the Revelation where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. A few verses before, that same person is described as he who hath the key of David so that if knocking will not avail, he has the key and can and will come in. Now if the knocking of an earnest minister prevail not with you this morning, there remains still that secret opening of the heart by the Spirit, so that you shall be compelled. I thought it my duty to labor with you as though I must do it now. Now I throw it into my master's hands. It cannot be his will that we should trivial in birth and yet not bring forth spiritual children. It is with him, he is master of the heart, and the day shall declare it, that some of you constrained by sovereign grace have become the willing captives of the all-conquering Jesus and have bowed your hearts to him through the sermon of this morning. Well, that was the lengthy Compel Them to Come by Charles Spurgeon. That was, like I said, a very interesting sermon in that it was entirely evangelistic. A majority of it was directed to the lost or those uh, standing outside the highways. And again and again, he tries at every avenue, and I find most unique, he even uh, commands the lost to come in. I hope this is a an encouragement in our evangelism, and I hope you'll join us next week. Let me close in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, you have called us. By the power of your Spirit, you have drawn us into your house. You have gifted us with pastors and ministers who are given a good task to preach, to beg, to compel, Lord. 
May we, in our evangelism, uh, not give such a light invitation, but a weighty one, that we may feel for our brothers uh, the joy that is of Christ and the damnation that awaits those who reject, Lord. We ask this in his name. Amen.